Chapter Ten of Seventeen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jonathan Burchard, May two thousand nine. Seventeen by Booth Tarkington. Chapter Ten. Mister Parcher and Love. Mr. Parcher, that unhappy gentleman, having been driven indoors from his own porch, had attempted to read Plutarch's Lives in the library, but owing to the adjacency of the porch and the summer necessity for open windows, his escape spared only his eyes and not his suffering ears. The house was small, being but half of a double one, with small rooms, and the parlor, library, and dining room all about equally exposed to the porch, which ran along the side of the house. Mr. Parcher had no refuge except bed or the kitchen and as he was troubled with chronic insomnia, and the cook had callers in the kitchen, his case was desperate. Most unfortunately, too, his reading lamp, the only one in the house, was a fixture near a window, and just beyond that window sat Miss Pratt and William in sweet unconsciousness, while Miss Parcher entertained the overflow, consisting of Mr. Johnny Watson, at the other end of the porch. Listening perforce to the conversation of the former couple, though conversation is far from the expression later used by Mr. Parcher to describe what he heard, he found it impossible to sit still in his chair. He jerked and twitched with continually increasing restlessness. Sometimes he gasped, and other times he moaned a little, and there were times when he muttered huskily. "'Oh, cutums!' came the silvery voice of Miss Pratt from the likewise silvery porch outside, underneath the summer moon. Darlin' Floppet, look, Ickle Boy Baxter, go and make imitations of Darlin' Floppet again. See, Ickle Boy Baxter puts head one side, then other side, just like Darlin' Floppet, then barks just like Darlin' Floppet. Ladies and gentlemen, imitations of Darlin' Floppet by Ickle Boy Baxter. Burp, warp, burp, warp, came the voice of William Sylvanus Baxter. And in the library, Plutarch's lives moved convulsively while with writhing lips Mr. Parcher muttered to himself. "'More! More!' cried Miss Pratt, clapping her hands again. "'Do it again, Ickle Boy Baxter! Burp, warp! Burp, warp, warp!' "'Word!' muttered Mr. Parcher. Miss Pratt's voice became surcharged with honeyed wonder. "'How did he learn such marvellous, marvellous imitations of Darlin' Floppet? "'He had to go on the big, big stage and be a really actor, oughtn't he, Darlin' Floppet? "'He could make millions and millions of dollardies, couldn't he, Darlin' Floppet?' "'William's modest laugh disclaimed any great ambition for himself in this line. "'Oh, I could always think up imitations of animals, things like that, "'but I hardly would care to adopt the stage for a career.' would you there was a thrill in his voice when he pronounced the ineffably significant word you miss pratt became intensely serious it's my dream she said william seated upon a stool at her feet gazed up at the amber head divinely splashed by the rain of moonlight the fire with which she spoke stirred him as few things had ever stirred him he knew she had just revealed a side of herself which she reserved for only the chosen few who were capable of understanding her, and he fell into a hushed rapture. It seemed to him that there was a sacredness about this moment, and he sought vaguely for something to say that would live up to it and not be out of keeping. Then, like an inspiration, there came into his head some words he had read that day and thought beautiful. He had found them beneath an illustration in a magazine and he spoke them almost instinctively. "'It was wonderful of you to say that to me,' he said. "'I shall never forget it.' "'It's my dream!' Miss Pratt exclaimed again, with the same enthusiasm. "'It's my dream!' "'You would make a glorious actress,' he said. At that her mood changed. She laughed a laugh like a sweet little girl's laugh, not Jane's, and setting her rocking chair in motion, cuddled the fuzzy white doglet in her arms, Eagle boy Baxter, tie and flatter box us, ton and flop it. Naughty, naughty flatter box. No, no, William insisted earnestly. I meant it, but, but, but what comes? What do you think about actors and actresses making love to each other on the stage? Do you think they have to really feel it, or do they just pretend? Well, said Miss Pratt weightily, sometimes one way, sometimes the other. William's gravity became more and more profound. "'Yes, but how can they pretend like that? Don't you think love is a sacred thing, Cousin Lola?' Fictitious sisterships, brotherships, and cousinships are devices to push things along. 
well known to seventeen and even more advanced ages. On that wonderful evening of their first meeting, William and Miss Pratt had cosily arranged to be called, respectively, Ickle Boy Baxter and Cousin Lola. Thus they had broken down the tedious formalities of their first twenty minutes together. "'Don't you think love is sacred?' he repeated in the deepest tone of which his vocal cords were capable. "'Es,' said Miss Pratt. "'I do,' William was emphatic. "'I think love is the most sacred thing there is. I don't mean some kinds of love. I mean real love. You take some people. I don't believe they ever know what real love means. They talk about it, maybe, but they don't understand it. Love is something nobody can understand unless they feel it, and if they don't understand it, they don't feel it. Don't you think so?' Yes. Love, William continued, his voice lifting and thrilling to the great theme, love is something nobody can ever have but one time in their lives, and if they don't have it then, why, probably they never will. Now, if a man really loves a girl, why, he'd do anything in the world she wanted him to. Don't you think so? Yes, Deedums, said the silvery voice. But if he didn't, then he wouldn't, said William vehemently. But when a man really loves a girl, he will. Now you take a man like that, and he can generally do just about anything the girl he loves wants him to. Say, for instance, she wants him to love her even more than he does already. Or almost anything like that. And supposing she asks him to. Well, he would go ahead and do it. If they really loved each other, he would. He paused a moment. Then in a lowered tone he said, I think real love is sacred, don't you? Yes. Don't you think love is the most sacred thing there is, that is, if it's real love? Yes. I do, said William warmly. I'm I'm glad you feel like that, because I think real love is the kind nobody could have but just once in their lives. But if it isn't real love, why, why most people never have it at all, because... He paused, seeming to seek for the exact phrase which would express his meaning. Because the real love a man feels for a girl and a girl for a man, if they really love each other, and you look at a case like that, and of course they would both love each other, or it wouldn't be real love, well, what I say is, if it's real love, well, it's, it's sacred, because I think that kind of love is always sacred. Don't you think love is sacred if it's the real thing? Yes, said Miss Pratt. Do flop it again. Be flop it. Burp, warp, burp, warp, warp. And within the library, an agonized man writhed and muttered, Word, word, word. The hoarse repetition had become almost continuous. But out on the porch, that little jasmine-scented bower in Arcady, where youth cried to youth and golden heads were haloed in the moonshine, there fell a silence. Not utter silence, for out there an ethereal music sounded constantly unheard and forgotten by older ears. Time was when the sly playwrights used incidental music in their dramas. They knew that an audience would be moved so long as the music played, credulous while that crafty enchantment lasted. And when the galled Mr. Parcher wondered how those young people out on the porch could listen to each other and not die, it was because he did not hear and had forgotten the music that throbs in the veins of youth. Nevertheless, it may not be denied that despite his poor memory, this man of fifty was deserving of a little sympathy. It was William who broke the silence. How, he began, and his voice trembled a little, how, how do you, how do you think of me when I'm not with you? Think nicicums, Miss Pratt responded. Flop it in me, think nicicums. No, said William, I mean what name do you have for me when you're thinking about me? Miss Pratt seemed to be puzzled, perhaps justifiably, and she made a cooing sound of interrogation. I mean like this, William explained. For instance, when you first came, I always thought of you as Milady, when I wrote that poem, you know. Yes, Boofums. But now I don't, he said. Now I think of you by another name when I'm alone. It, it just sort of came to me. I was kind of sitting around this afternoon, and I didn't know I was thinking about anything at all very much, and then all of a sudden I said it to myself out loud. It was about as strange a thing as I ever knew of. Don't you think so? Yes, it is dest weird, she answered. What are dat pity names? I called you, said William huskily and reverently. I called you my baby talk lady. They were startled by a crash from within the library. A heavy weight seemed to have fallen, or to have been hurled, a considerable distance. Stepping to the window, 
William beheld a large volume lying in a distorted attitude at the foot of the wall opposite to that in which the reading lamp was a fixture. But of all human life the room was empty, for Mr. Parcher had given up and was now hastening to his bed in the last faint hope of saving his reason. His symptoms, however, all pointed to its having fled, and his wife, looking up from some computations in laundry charges, had but a vision of windmill gestures as he passed the door of her room. Then, not only for her, but for the inoffensive people who lived in the other half of the house, the closing of his own door took place in a really memorable manner. William, gazing upon the fallen Plutarch, had just offered the explanation, "'Somebody must have thrown it at a bug or something, I guess,' when the second explosion sent its reverberations through the house. "'My goodness!' Miss Pratt exclaimed, jumping up. William laughed reassuringly, remaining calm. "'It's only a door blue shut upstairs,' he said. "'Let's sit down again, just the way we were.' Unfortunately for him, Mr. Joe Bullitt now made his appearance at the other end of the porch. Mr. Bullitt, although almost a year younger than either William or Johnny Watson, was of a turbulent and masterful disposition. Moreover, in regard to Miss Pratt, his affections were in as ardent a state as those of his rivals, and he lacked Johnny's meekness. He firmly declined to be shunted by Miss Parcher, who was trying to favor William's cause, according to a promise he had won of her by strong pleading. Regardless of her efforts, Mr. Bullitt descended upon William and his baby talk lady, and received from the latter a honeyed greeting, somewhat to the former's astonishment, and not at all to his pleasure. "'Oh, goody cute!' cried Miss Pratt. "'Here's a big brother Josie Joe!' And she lifted her little dog close to Mr. Bullitt's face, guiding one of Floppet's paws with her fingers. "'Stroke big brother Josie Joe's pink cheeks, darling Floppet!' Josie Joe's pink cheeks were indicated by the expression, pink teeks, evidently for her accompanying action was to pass Floppet's paw lightly over those glowing surfaces. "'That's nice,' she remarked. "'Stroke him gently, precious Floppet, and then we'll coax him to make pity singing for us, like us did yesterday.' She turned to William. "'Coax him to make pity singing. I love his voice. I'm dest crazy over it, isn't too?' William's passion for Mr. Bullitt's voice appeared to be under control. He laughed coldly, almost harshly. "'Him sing!' he said. "'Has he been trying to sing around here? I wonder the family didn't call for the police.' It was to be seen that Mr. Bullitt did not relish the sally. "'Well, they will,' he retorted, "'if you ever spring one of your solos on em. And turning to Miss Pratt, he laughed loudly and bitterly. "'You ought to hear Silly Bill sing, sometime when you don't mind going to bed sick for a couple of days.' Symptoms of truculence at once became alarmingly pronounced on both sides. William was naturally incensed, and, as for Mr. Bullitt, he had endured a great deal from William every evening since Miss Pratt's arrival. William's evening clothes were hard enough for both Mr. Watson and Mr. Bullitt to bear, without any additional insolence on the part of the wearer. Big brother Josie Joe took a step forward toward his enemy, and breathed audibly. "'Let's all sing,' the tactful Miss Pratt proposed hastily. "'Come on, May, and Cousin Johnny jump up,' she called to Miss Parcher and Mr. Watson. "'Sing in school, girls and boys, sing in school, ding, ding, sing in school, bells are ringin'. The diversion was successful. Miss Parcher and Mr. Watson joined the other group with alacrity, and the five young people were presently seated close together upon the steps of the porch, sending their voices out upon the air and up to Mr. Parcher's window in the song they found loveliest that summer. Miss Pratt carried the air. William also carried it part of the time, and hunted for it the rest of the time, though never in silence. Miss Parcher sang alto, Mr. Bullitt sang bass, and Mr. Watson sang tenor. That is, he sang as high as possible, often making the top sound of a chord, and always repeating the last phrase of each line before the others finished it. The melody was a little too sweet, possibly, while the singers thought so highly of the words that Mr. Parcher missed not one, especially as the vocal rivalry between Josie Joe and Ickleboy Baxter incited each of them to prevent Miss Pratt from hearing the other. William sang loudest of all. Mr. Parcher had at no time any difficult in recognizing his voice. Oh, I love my love in the morning, and I love my love at night. I love my love in the dawning, and when the stars are bright. Some may love the sunshine, others may love the dew, some may love the raindrops, but I love only you. 
by the stars up above it is you i love yes i love my own lay you they sang it four times then mr bullitt sang his solo tell her o golden moon how i adore her william followed with the violate loves the cowslip but i love you and after that they all sang oh i love my love in the morning again all this while that they sang of love mr parcher was moving to and fro upon his bed not more than eighteen feet in an oblique upward slanting line from the heads of the serenaders long long he tossed listening to the young voices singing of love long long he thought of love and many many times he spoke of it aloud though he was alone in the room and in thus speaking of it he would give utterance to phrases and words probably never before used in connection with love since the world began his thoughts and at intervals his mutterings continued to be active far into the night long after the callers had gone and though his household and the neighborhood were at rest with never a katy did outside to rail at the waning moon and by a coincidence not more singular than most coincidences it happened that at just about the time he finally fell asleep a young lady at no great distance from him awoke to find herself thinking of him End of chapter ten